Hi, I'm Pastor Gun Kim. The topic I'm going to cover is holistic partnership mission led by a local church. This is a case study of Maranatha Vision Church in San Francisco Bay Area, which I planted in uh, 2006. Last December, I retired early and returned to being a missionary. I would like to talk about how God led Maranatha Vision Church to become a missionary church. For me, planting a church was a miracle. I had no intention of becoming a pastor. I worked at a university in Seoul, Korea for 21 years as an accounting professor. At the age of 53, I obeyed God's calling and I quit professorship and came to America as a tent maker uh, missionary to evangelize Muslim community in San Francisco Bay Area. Pastoring a church was the very thing I wanted to avoid. Because I'm a PK, I have a kind of wound in church, especially in Korean immigrant church. However, one day I found myself planting a church and pastoring with Korean immigrants. By the way, I'm a first generation Korean American. It is my Lord who gave me passionate heart to plant a church. I'm sure Jesus changed my heart. And that's a big miracle to me. I could find the reason why this miracle happened to me after I started the church. One day, Jesus enlightened me with this thought. If I work as a missionary by myself, then what? Retirement, death, and that's it. However, what if I plant a church and make it a missionary church? Even after my retirement death, the church remains. Church is the only institution God uses to accomplish His will on this earth. And church is forever. Since then, I did my best to make our church a missionary church. To achieve the vision of making missionary church, I pronounced three specific visions to the starting members of our church. Number one, making all members Jesus' disciples. Disciples are not just believers, but followers of Jesus, denying himself, taking up cross, and following every day, obeying to the point of death. Number two, building a community of Jesus' family. Church is an extended family. Family meets every day. Early church members gathered every day in the temple and at home. So our church tried to meet every day with early morning prayer meeting, evening prayer meeting every day, and mokjang meeting and as well as Sunday worship. Number three, witnessing the gospel in everyday life to the end of the earth. All members are disciples and they are missionaries. We encourage them to live missional lives. God blessed our church. He sent many people to our church. At the end of first year, it was 300, and the next year, it was 500. I was not glad at the rapid growth in size because it seemed impossible for me to make all 500 of them missionaries according to our vision. These were some measures I took to uh, speed up uh, discipleship training in full force. I changed cell church to Mokjang, which is family church. I changed Mokjang names to UUP's names, offered uh, mission trainings, encouraged short-term mission trips to Muslim regions, emphasized intercessory prayers. For the first three years, we did our best to make our church a missionary church. We sent our first long-term missionary to Turkey at the end of first year, and second missionary to Israel in June 2009. But in the third year, we encountered some problems. There were some divisions in the leadership group because of the mission issues. And that led me to doubt on the vision of missionary church. For the first time, I was doubting if our church could really become a missionary church 
in the context of Korean immigrant churches in 21st century. I tried to find out the cause of the problems, but I didn't know at the time. Later, I found that the problems mainly arose due to the limitation of the traditional old mission paradigm. Of course, we were under old paradigm at the time. Under the old mission paradigm, church are left passive in the core mission activities. As a sending church, the only thing we could do was just sending missionaries and supporting them financially with prayers. All mission activities should be left entirely to mission organization and long-term missionaries. There was this connection between our short-term mission efforts and the works of the long-term missionaries. Many people went to short-term missions through the mission organization we worked with. But those works were not related to the works of the long-term missionaries we sent off. The bigger problem arose from the mission organization we worked with. I would not tell the exact nature of the problems. We, however, realized for the first time that local church and mission organization could have conflict each other. The only thing I could do in this situation was just praying and ask help from Jesus. Turning point. Jesus answered our prayer. He led us to meet Pastor Ahn and many good co-workers and pastors of Global Assistant Partners in August 2009. For the first time in my life, I heard that mission paradigm was changed. The new mission paradigm was holistic partnership mission led by local church, strategically targeting UUPGs. Long name, isn't it? When I heard the new paradigm, I was partly shocked, but very glad. I wanted to confirm it by myself through the Bible. I read and studied the New Testament again and again for fact-checking. It was right. In the Bible, it was always local church that led the world mission, not mission organization. And mission was always done with a teamwork among partners. I found the new paradigm was not actually new. It has been there 2,000 years since the early church. Only we didn't obey what the apostles practiced in the early church. So we decided to follow the Bible and moved to the new paradigm immediately. I can tell from my experience that the key to successful mission for the local church is to meet with the right mission organization. We started a new phase in mission with GAP since then. Uh, let me quickly introduce holistic partnership mission led by local church. I'll call it HPM model or King's mission. It's easier to remember this way, right? Uh, the new paradigm, the King's mission has three characteristics. One, targeting UU pages. Two, change in the role of local church. You know, local church takes leadership. Three, change in the role of missionary. Long-term missionary should become a strategic coordinator. As a strategic coordinator, long-term missionary should aim for not just one nation or tribe, but all the nation and tribes on the earth. This diagram explains how the holistic partnership mission model works. I do not have enough time to explain in detail. I'll just mention it briefly, the outline. There are four pillars, local church, mission organization, indigenous churches, and long-term missionary. Four pillars working together as one body, and all the activities are focused on raising workers and plant churches in UUPGs. First pillar, local church, should lead the mission, sending off long-term missionaries, supporting mission. All the resources comes from local church. Second pillar, uh, mission organization is a professional in mission. They provide training, information, networks to the local church. It also supports overseas missionaries sent by local church. 
Mission organization makes mission strategy and execute mission plans. Third pillar, long-term missionaries work as a strategic coordinator. They are the ones who do the church planting by training the local workers. Fourth pillar, indigenous churches. They support church planting ministry at the fields. To implement holistic partnership mission led by local church, we immediately did some uh, measures. We appointed mission center administrator. We started training the whole church members. Uh, we taught the new mission paradigm um, through mission seminars. It is important to mobilize the whole congregation, not just a few. We sent off long-term missionary to India. We adopted North India. Usually people adopt tribes, but we adopted the whole area. Because when I saw this map, uh, God gave me burden to plant churches in the whole region of North India. The red dot means there's many UPGs. Lastly, we sent off short-term mission teams to India. We launched our first North India mission on December 2010. 17 of our members devoted Christmas vacation to Jesus for 13 days. Of course, we prepared thoroughly beforehand, including 16-week mission training. 17 of our church members went to Bihar State in five teams. These are some pictures from the first uh, short-term mission trip. Our teams are blessing local workers at the morning worship. We worshiped together every morning. We emphasized corporate prayer. The important uh, thing we learned is uh, church gives birth to church. The DNA of our church spreads to Indian workers. When we pray and share the gospel, they learn from us by watching us. Since we are a praying church, they learn and they also become a praying church like us. We start a corporate prayer by shouting, Juya! or Jesus, and they follow us, exactly. If you visit the churches we planted, the spirituality of Indian churches are very much like us. We share the gospel to the villages that never heard of Jesus. Some far farming villages we visited, uh, there were only women and children. We gave balloons and candies to children. This is the result of first uh, short mission. We visited 100 villages. Among the 10,000 people we evangelized, 3,800 accepted Jesus. We related the new believers to the nearby house churches leaders. We launched a second North India mission in the next summer of 2011. Youth group went with youth pastor. I also went with them to do other village ministry. These are the team members seven youth and youth pastor and me. Youth are sharing the gospel in a village. This is school. Uh, our youth team is performing Jesus skit. They're sharing the gospel in front of the classroom. Students are reading the gospel tracts we distributed. Students gathered at the auditorium. They are listening to our gospel presentation. They are accepting Jesus by raising their hands. Most of them heard the name of Jesus Christ for the first time in their lives. Following an acceptance prayer. I believe this would be an important moment in their lives. Here is public elementary and middle school. Teachers are in the middle. At that time, uh, they were wide open to the gospel. These are the results of uh, Second North India Mission. Youth visited 20 public schools and 9 villages. 8,400 accepted Jesus. Currently, it is impossible to visit public schools to share the gospel because of persecution. Now, India is in the top 10 leading countries of Christian persecution, and it is getting worse. After first and second short-term mission, we made midpoint assessment. These are the six lessons we learned. One. We found that our holistic partnership mission model works. Two, 
we modified our mission goals. Instead of sharing the gospel to as many people as possible, we changed our goal to making disciples and planting house churches as Jesus commanded. To do this, we decided to ask our Indian workers to prepare as many persons of pieces as possible in advance before we come to India. In church planting mission, person of pieces are very important. They are the ones who welcome us and gather their families and relatives for evangelization meeting. Usually after meeting, the person of peace becomes a house church leader. In first and second mission trips, we had evangelism meetings at the large open space. We, however, decided to do the same meeting at the person of peace's house from next trip. Three, we decided not to bring any balloons and candies for children or water purifier or uh, solar panels for adults. We found those things only hindered our gospel sharing. We decided to bring gospel only. Four, we finalized the 12 week mission training program. We made the training manual. It covers how to share testimony and how to share the gospel, what Bible verses to memorize, how to prepare in prayer in advance, etc. We put more emphasis on corporate prayer. Five, uh, we, made the, uh, uh, we made the standard procedures by putting together the best practices we did during the first and second missions. Code of conduct covers from waking up in the morning to going into sleep, everything. How to do QT sharing, corporate prayer, how to pray in the car, rise, etc. Our code of conduct do not allow any personal talks during the seven to 10 days of the whole mission period. Nobody should uh, talk personally. Only praise, prayer, and testimony are allowed. We strictly enforce this and they follow us. We also made guidelines for a village mission. It covers how to enter villages, how to share testimonies and gospel, how to connect to local workers, etc. Six. We decided to adopt more specific target area. At first, not knowing, we adopted the whole northern India and realized it was too big of an, uh, of an area. So we narrowed down uh, and focused to the radius of 300 kilometers around Delhi. It covers, as you see on the map, six states and Delhi. This area is the most unevangelized area in India and the most difficult area to plant churches. We launched third North India church planting mission on December 2011. Starting with our third mission trip, we were able to properly launch a full-scale church planting mission. Our primary task was planting house churches by making disciples. Our Indian workers did their best to obtain as many personal pieces as possible before teams arrived. Some pictures. They're presenting gospel at a Muslim village in Haryana state. Village women watching on the side. Women are not allowed to come down and join the men's meeting. Acceptance prayer. Here's as well. This is the result of third mission trip. You can see a number of house church leader appointed, which is same as house church planted, as well as number of villages, number of attendees, number of accepted Christians. One thing to note is that uh, we experienced persecution this time. Teens experienced dangerous moments when they proclaimed gospel in a few villages. Some villages were more hostile to the gospel. We, however, thanked God for that because that was a sign of our maturity. He does not allow beyond what we can bear. That means we grew that much.
maturation. Uh, this is our mission progress chart for the past 10 years. Um, for instance, in 2013, there were three church planting mission trips and one mission training, right? On the average, we went three times a year. As time goes, our mission expanded from India to Middle East, Nepal, Myanmar, Southern China, and Japan. In our church, I encourage at least one family member to go to mission once a year. Most members save money vacation days to go on a mission every year. Looking back the uh, last 10 years of King's mission, we went through six stages in church planting mission. I put this in a timeline diagram. First stage uh, for the first two years, we emphasized planting seeds, which is evangelization, to as many people as possible. Second stage, the next two years, we emphasized planting house churches, collaborating with indigenous workers. Third stage, we went through a year of evaluation. Our question was, the indigenous workers, local workers, can plant house church much better than us. Why should we continue to do the same work nevertheless? We could find answers and we could have the assurance of what we're doing is right. Three answers. The Indian workers can break through with us. They are bound by social caste. We are foreigners. With us, they can access any caste. They can expand their work with us. Second answer, Indian workers are being equipped by us. They learn by working together with us. We spread the DNA of our church to them. The teamwork provides them the equipping toward God's people. Third answer, Indian workers are encouraged by us. We found they are encouraged, strengthened by us spiritually. They get spiritual energy working with us. So whatever seemed impossible by themselves becomes possible with us. Fourth stage was planting and equipping house churches. We started to equipping the existing house churches in addition to planting new churches. We taught 10 commands, which is a basic Bible study material to the new believers. We even hold one day revival meeting with the indigenous workers. To encourage them, we even washed their feet during the worship. They were so much moved. Stage five, uh, from 2016, we entered into expansion and mobilization phase. Our short-term mission expanded to other countries. And we also held mission conference at our church to mobilize other local churches around. Final stage uh, was discipleship of world churches from 19, uh, 2019 to present. We were trying to expand our mission horizon to the whole world. To accomplish this objective, we are holding the 2020 Gap for FTT conference. Village church planting mission. I'll briefly explain how we performed the village mission in India. This picture shows a typical uh, church planting mission team. Four are from our church. Usually um, uh, we have three per team, but this time it's four. Local worker, interpreter. Usually we don't have separate interpreter. The local workers uh, interpret for us. Um, personal piece and driver. How our team carry out village mission? We train 10 steps to our team members. Number one, entry to worship. As soon as we enter the personal pieces house, we start worship. We teach easy Hindi praise song to them and they follow us. Step three, team introduction. Four, we share personal testimony. Five, proclaim gospel. Six, invitation to accept Jesus and acceptance prayer. Seven, a uh, local pastor baptizes them immediately. Three reasons. 
one, uh, that's how it was done in early churches. Two, because there is persecution in India, if they are not determined to stand up the persecution, they would not be baptized. Three, to discern if they truly accepted Jesus and follow Jesus. In Hindi culture, many accept Jesus as one of their many gods. During baptism, we ask them to leave other gods, other many gods, and accept Jesus as one and only God. Step eight, we lay hands on them and pray for healing. Nine, we ask them to make offering to God. This is to teach them to become a self-supportive house church from the beginning. Step 10, we appoint a personal peace as a new house church leader. Discipleship of other churches. We held two mission conferences in our church to expand the King's mission to other churches and find partner churches around. First one was in 2012. And second one was 2016 West Coast Missions Conference, including California, Washington, and Oregon. Altogether, more than 100 pastors and leaders from uh, 66 churches attended. God gave us three precious partnering churches from this conference. Our first partner church was Emmanuel Presbyterian Church. Right after the consultation, they immediately committed. They sent uh, 12 people to join our 13-week Indian mission training. They drove an hour to participate in the training on every Sundays from 3 to 5.30 p.m. Everybody completed the 13-week training successfully. Eight people went to India mission with us. It was 41 people altogether. Uh, we assigned eight people to, uh, from uh, uh, Emmanuel Presbyterian Church to our team, one for each team. We provided on-the-job training in India. All of eight people were all trained as good leaders. In the following year, we let them recruit and train their own teams through the eight leaders we raised. We helped them to launch their own church planting mission teams. We sent them to Gujarat state in India. Of course, our partner uh, Gap and long-term missionary helped and guided them in India. It was very successful. In this way, they sent more than 10 members to India every year since then. Second partner is a World Mission Baptist Church in San Jose. They started uh, in 2015, the same process. We trained uh, three team leaders. From the next year, they went independent. They adopted Maharashtra state in India. From um, 2017, they go twice a year. The senior pastor goes two to three times a year to train 70 Maharashtra workers. They even made offerings and built this church in Aurangabad, Maharashtra. Isn't it beautiful? Now the whole church happily serves India. Now we have completed one cycle of King's mission. Inside the circle is a new mission paradigm, the Holistic Partnership Mission or King's Mission led by local church. Based on this, we adopted UUPGs and then we sent off long-term missionaries and then we performed church planting mission by sending short-term teams two to three times a year. And then we trained Indian workers and then we made disciples of other churches. In this way, one cycle was completed. Where do we go now? It is time to expand the King's Mission model to the whole churches in the world. That's why we're holding 2020 GAP for FTT conference. Long-lasting fruits in Northern India. God blessed our efforts and made us to bear many fruits. This is the latest tally covering last 10 years starting from um, 2010 to 2019. 
We planted almost 4,000 house churches and more than 400 local churches. We raised more than 400 indigenous workers. Surely some reasons are the result of collaborating with other partnering churches. I humbly confess that God did this alone. God blessed our church beyond comprehension during the last 14 years. Initially, we decided not to purchase any church building to focus on, to focus on world mission. However, God gave this beautiful church building almost free to us. We fully focused on world mission and He provided all our needs beyond what our prayer. More than anything else, our church is becoming a missional church. Our church members are yearning for the early church revival. Our church members are trying to live a missional lives. Our church is becoming a church preparing the day of His coming. I believe these are the greatest blessings. Conclusion I have presented how our church tried to become a missional church with a new mission paradigm. Now it is time to wrap up. How can we become a church fulfilling God's vision? I can boldly say these four things from my experience. Number one, it is totally dependent on the senior pastor. Number two, you have to partnering with the right mission organization. Number three, always remember that the driving force of any mission should be intercessory prayers. Number four, Holy Spirit does it all. Pastor John Piper said, there are only three kinds of Christians when it comes to world missions. Zealous goers, jealous senders, and disobedient. Where are you in? I hope your church belongs to the zealous group. Thank you. God bless you all.